Well, today is the 15th of August. Uh, we're still in lockdown here in Sydney, uh, but uh, uh, we can rejoice in all that God has given us. Uh, I'm focusing today on uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 36. My topic is don't get uppity. Uh, so uh, we'll be looking at verses 17 to 36 of this passage today. Uh, and I'll read most of that in my talk, but uh, to put it in context, I'm going to be reading verses 1 to 18 right now. Romans chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God didn't reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I've reserved for myself 7,000 who've not bowed the knees to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it can't be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they didn't obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it's written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they can't see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in, in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, don't consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root, but the root supports you. We're still considering the Jews. But now Paul reminds us Gentiles not to think we're so good because the Jews haven't done well. When Paul criticises his Jewish compatriots, it's not to condemn them, but to urge them to find God as he really is. Being Jewish isn't the answer. Paul doesn't reject them. He already said, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. That's in chapter 10. We must find the way of Christ together. A Catholic priest phoned me, an old friend. I have a lot of time for him, though he and I are poles apart in many respects. We have a sound common core in Christ and that makes us brothers. The Jew versus Gentile thing is similar. Paul isn't setting up conflict. Jew and Gentiles are branches in the one great people of God. So in chapter 11, he ties up loose ends and shows how Jews and Gentiles truly belong together. A Jewish remnant will be saved along with engrafted Gentiles and the result is a great united hope for all humanity. Now don't be mistaken, God didn't just use the Jews to prepare for the Messiah and then abandon them uh, to now work only through believing Gentiles. Don't downplay the Jews. On the other hand, don't focus on Israel with the church being only God's plan B until the Jews believe and then get back on track. 
Both views are wrong. It is through Christ and his church that God's hidden plan is revealed to unite both Jew and Gentile in one head. Paul reminds us that Israel is firmly in God's sight. In chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. If God has rejected the Jews, how did a Jew like Paul get to be saved? No, Paul declares God didn't reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. God has always preserved people to his name and he will not cease doing that. His plan will not be thwarted. Paul is confident for Israel. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not think you are superior. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they're enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. The Jews might currently hate the gospel, but they will share in God's eternal plan together with us. God still loves them. The hardening is temporary until the right number of Gentiles, us Gentiles, come into God's kingdom but the Jews will not be saved without us. Worldwide, the gospel is spreading like Californian wildfire, but the Jews still resist, and God is delaying the judgment until the whole number is saved. But we, we Gentiles mustn't think we're superior. Yes, God is working among us, and the Jews are stagnating. Rejoice in our benefits. But don't crow about it. If God blesses us, it's to bring us to our knees, not to get us on high horses. As I said, don't get uppity. Ultimately, Jew or Gentile, pioneer or homekeeper, it's about grace. Grace, faith and mercy through Jesus. Paul says, if some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, don't consider yourself superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You don't support the root, but the root supports you. You'll say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but, if, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Don't be arrogant, but tremble. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. And if they don't persist in the unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? We Gentiles are like branches of a wild scrub olive, but God has culled branches from the good tree to, cra to graft us in who are branches from that rubbish tree and now part of the good tree. It's crazy, but it might just work. Farmers don't do that. They graft branches from a fruitful tree into the stock of a scrub olive tree, but not the other way around. Yet God has done just that, so that together, by faith, Gentiles and Jews can share in the same saving life of Christ. 
God is enormously good and gracious to us, but it doesn't make us superior. We're all sinners. We all share in the olive tree of salvation by grace alone. Never imagine that God owes us. God owes us nothing and we owe him all. Meanwhile, what better can we do than to rejoice and be glad in the mercy and grace of God revealed through Jesus our Lord. So here's what it's all about. God's plan is always to unite. He has a plan concealed through the ages, but now revealed in Jesus, a plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth under one head, that is Jesus himself. That's in Ephesians chapter one, read it for yourself. We have no grounds to think we're superior. The hardening of Israel is only until the rest of us are brought in. Skipping down now to verse 30, Paul says, Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. Eventually it balances out. God is bringing in the full number of Gentiles, but overall, all the disobedient children, Jew or Gentile, will enter the full experience of his mercy. Now don't get into knots over verse 26 where Paul says, and in this way all Israel will be saved. It's not promising mass Jewish conversion, though we pray it will be. True Jews are those who, like Abraham, believe God and it is credited to them as righteousness. They are the Israel that will be saved. Of course, some Jews have always turned and believed. In, in Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice, uh, part of the plot is about a Jewish woman, Jessica, who is converted. It isn't about physical descent from Abraham. It's about trusting God and walking by faith the way Abraham did. When all who trust and obey like Abraham are brought in, then all Israel will be, will be saved. When all who hear and respond are brought in, old enmities will be ended and peace will rule because Jesus rules over all. A merciful God loves us. It isn't about what we deserve. There's nothing to get uppity about. I'd like to end with a quote from the Merchant of Venice about mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest, tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne of monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered way. It is enthroned in the heart of kings. It is an attribute of God himself and earthly power doth then show like God's when mercy seasons justice. God loves us so, so much. He pours out mercy on us and grants us grace upon grace. Let's rejoice and give him thanks. Amen.